Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Lipkin. I'm the NC Pingree Director of the Fulps Library here at the Peabody Essex Museum. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to the presentation, Privateers of the Caribbean, Bermuda and the Bahamas after the American Revolution with the 2023 Francis E. Malamy Research Fellow at the Phillips Library, Ross Niedervelt, who will present the findings of his research project, Loyalism, Privateering and American Sovereignty in the Atlantic Border Sea, 1783 to 1815. Thanks for choosing to spend some time with us. And closed captioning for tonight's program is available by selecting the show captions option on your Zoom toolbar. So this work was created by Marie Watt in collaboration with community sewing circles hosted by the artist. And Marie's work asks us all to consider what the world would look like if we thought of ourselves as companion species. It's currently on view in our ongoing exhibition on this ground being and belonging in America. And I hope you have a chance to see that, see that exhibition at PEM. It brings two extraordinary collections of Native American and American art together for the first time in our institution's history. And this long-term installation explores how art can help us understand what it means to belong to family, community, and this place we now call America. So I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the Phillips Library and the Peabody Essex Museum are on the ancestral territory of the Agawam, Pawtucket, Namkeag, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag. Many other indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations, and indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. So please join us in honoring their communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you. I'll take this opportunity to offer our very special thanks to Michael Malamy and his children, Jocelyn and Adam, who funded this annual fellowship in 2007 as a lasting tribute to Francis. Francis Malamy had deep roots within the library. She was a longstanding member of the museum family and dedicated tireless hours processing manuscripts in our collection. She was an extraordinary individual who believed that the Phillips Library provides value to the academic community and the public and realize the importance of the collection and its potential impact on the greater intellectual world. Many, many thanks are due to our PEM colleagues for pulling this together and helping to make it happen, especially Chip Van Dyke, Corey Dodge, and our visitor engagement and marketing teams. And of course, Ross for sharing his research and knowledge with us. A bit of housekeeping, everyone's muted and cameras are off and we do encourage questions. So please feel free to submit them via the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can in the final portion of the program. A recording of tonight's presentation will be posted on PEM's YouTube channel, and we'll share that link with you when it's live. And at this point, I'd like to welcome to the screen Jennifer Hornsby, Phillips Library's Reference and Service Ac Access Services Librarian, to introduce Ross and to start the program. And I'm very grateful for Jen's hard work managing our fellowship programs and for, out for her outstanding supervision and guidance of our reference services. So Jen. Thank you, Dan. And I would also like to um, start by thanking Michael Malamy and his family for their generous support of this fellowship. The fellowship is an exciting way for the library to be able to help scholars with their travel to rally for research. And it also allows uh, the library staff insight into current topics of interest <clears throat> within the various fields that our collection touches upon. For those listeners who are interested, uh, the fellowship runs um, each calendar year with applications due the last Sunday of October. The main requirement is primary, uh, is use of our primary source materials within our collection. Ross is um, an adjunct history professor at Florida International University in Miami. His in-progress monograph, presently titled The Border Seas of a New British Empire, Security, Imperial Reconstitution, and the British Atlantic Islands in the Age of the American Revolution, examines the transformative impact of the American Revolution on the British Atlantic colonies of Bermuda, the Bahamas, and the Turks and Caicos Islands and their strategic importance for both British and American security between 1775 and 1824. 
He's previously published works um, including Caught Between Realities, The American Revolution, The Continental Congress, and Political Turmoil in the Bahama Islands in the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, and Securing the Borderlands and Seas in the American Revolution, the Spanish-American Association and Regional Security Against the British Empire in Spain and the American Revolution. New Approaches and Perspectives. And with that, I would love to turn the screen over to Ross to inform us about his presentation for tonight. Ross? Also, once again, would like to thank the Malmi uh, family and uh, the Phillips Library at Peabody Essex for hosting me and supporting my research. Um, it, without which I would not have been able to travel to and reside in New England for about three months conducting um, a lot of this fantastic research on um, the early relationship and post-revolutionary relationship between Bermuda and the Bahamas, the British Empire, and uh, the nascent United States. So I'd like to start off with um, a bit of backstory on the pre-revolutionary and revolutionary relationship between Bermuda and the Bahamas and the United States, because the, the transformation of that during the American Revolution um, really sets up uh, the fundamental impact that they would have on security and US sovereignty following the American Revolution. So in the years between the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, Bermuda and the De Bahamas deepened their dependency on the 13 mainland colonies for commercial trade, income, and provisions that support their agriculture, poor islands, and could not produce themselves. These dependencies, coupled with the lack of strong commercial and military connections to Britain, ultimately pulled the Bermudians and Bahamians into aiding the revolutionary American patriots against the British metropole during the early years of the American Revolution, through the Islanders assisting American patriot forces in acquiring gun, uh, their colony's gunpowder and munition, cannons, and other military stores in August of 1775 in the case of the, the gunpowder raid on Bermuda and in the Continental Congresses, or um, the Continental Navy's assault on Nassau and New Providence Island in early March of 1776. They created a sphere of influence for the 13 colonies that, although minor in scope compared to Britain's hold on its American colonies overall, did extend eastward into the Atlantic. Bermuda and the Bahamas also embodied vulnerable Atlantic zones or gray border regions that, while supportive of the American Patriots' endeavors, were capable of being turned by the increased presence of Britain's Royal Navy during the American Revolution and at, in the subsequent decades afterwards. Revolutionary American officials' understanding of this reality emerges in Benjamin Franklin and Silas Dean's communiques with Congress in 1775 and 1776. Franklin and Dean understood Britain's continued presence in and around the North American continent constituted the primary threat to an independent United States' long-term security. The possibility of poorly defined border zones surrounding the nascent United States presented an opportunity for Britain to undermine Americans' relationships with neighboring British and European colonists, as well as the Native American na nations on their frontier. Britain's continued control of Bermuda and the Bahamas, Franklin and Dean determined, posed a threat to American merchant shipping and any post-war Anglo-American peace. To deter this outcome, 
Dean called on the Continental Army to invade Bermuda and fortify it against British attack. In addition to the Continental Congress authorizing funds to be approved for the invasion and defense of the island. Franklin, for his part, attempted to win American control of both island colonies through various treaty and peace negotiations with France and Britain, advocating that the United States held claim to the islands in his sketch for a proposition for a peace with General William Howe in 1776 and in the Treaty of Alliance of 1778 with France. St. George Tucker, a Bermudian who immigrated to and practiced law in Virginia, also attempted to convince General George Washington to invade the colony in order to secure the Bermudian American trade, as well as Bermuda's independence from Great Britain. These fears of turning the islands against the United States all by Britain ultimately came to fruition as Britain attempted to bring Bermuda and the Bahamas firmly within the metropole sphere by tightening its naval control, its fortifications, and exerting stronger political and economic control after the revolution. In the Bahamas, following the Continental Navy's assault on the colonial capital at New Providence in 1776, the colonial government was beset by political infighting between the patriot sympathizing legislature and the loyal, loyalist governor, Montfort Brown. Um, and here in this particular image is a selection from the Phillips Library collection. This is a early print of the account of the Continental Navy's assault on New Providence that was published in Salem. And it's actually been quite helpful to my early research that I was conducting for first my master's thesis and then at the University of New Hampshire, and then my doctoral dissertation in Florida International in um, setting up the early discussion of Bahamians' relationships with American patriots. The Bahamians engaged in commercial trade with the American patriots for the first half of the revolution, but this shifted to widespread privateering activities from 1779 onwards. Bohemian privateers became such a threat to non-British flagged vessels that the continental forces and the Spanish military at Havana launched a joint attack on New Providence in May of 1782 in order to suppress the privateering menace. British military and political control over the Bahamas would be restored later in 1783 through a combination of a formal return from Spain under the terms of the drafted Treaty of Paris of 1783 and an armed loyalist assault in April of that year led by Andrew DeVoe of South Carolina. For Bermuda, due to Britain's quick naval occupation of the island beginning in mid-1776, Bermuda lacked the resulting power struggle within its colonial government that the Bahamas experienced. The second half of the revolution saw Bermudians increasingly shift their allegiances away from the rebellious colonies and towards Britain. By 1782, covert wartime trading between Bermudians and the American patriots had virtually ceased, and an increase in the Bermudian privateering attacks against American vessels caused the Continental Congress to view Bermuda as a loyalist adversary. Following the Revolutionary War, 
Bermuda and the Bahamas underwent significant social and economic transformations that cemented the islanders' allegiances to the British metropole. The American loyalist exodus to the Bahamas from Georgia, the Carolinas, and East Florida between 1780 and 1785 overwhelmed the established Bahamian population with both their numbers and their fierce animosity towards the American patriots and the United States. In 1784, in a move to relieve an ongoing post-war famine in the islands, the newly appointed governor, John Maxwell, approved American merchant vessels to import desperately needed cargoes of grain and provisions to the islands. American vessels arrival in Nassau Harbor, flying the flag of the United States, enraged loyalist settlers and refugees. Much to the bewilderment of the old inhabitants, the loyalist refugees rioted in the summer of 1784, attempted to strike down the vessel's American colors, and proceeded to smuggle those imported provisions out of the colony, an act that challenged both Bahamian, the Bahamian colonial governments, traditional actions and policies, and the nascent United States and its citizens' sovereignty abroad. To bolster the Bahamas and defend the new loyalist settlers, Lord Dunmore, the former governor of Virginia, who replaced Maxwell as the Bahamas royal governor in 1787, spared no expense in improving the colony's defenses. Over the mid to late 18th century, the island's main fortifications on New Providence fell into severe disrepair due to limited maintenance funds from both the colonial and imperial treasuries, which enabled three successful attacks against the island by both American and Spanish forces during the course of the American Revolution. Dunmore and the British War Office engaged in substantial defensive undertakings, which resulted in the construction of Fort Charlotte and Fincastle new barracks for additional troop regiments, and two arrays of batteries during the 1780s and 1790s. In total, Dunmore's defensive projects brought the expenditures to over 32,000 pounds, an astronomical sum for a decentralized island colony that previously held little interest from the British administration and produced very little in terms of um, exportable revenue through um, sugar or cotton or other uh, primary cash crops that determined wealth early in um, British America's mercantile system. Akin to the American Loyalists and British War Office Fund's transformation of the Bahamas, Bermudians encountered the end of the end of Britain's salutary neglect as an economic transformation that increasingly bound the island to the Royal Navy's presence. In Bermuda, the inhabitants emerged from the revolution, hopeful to reestablish their maritime commercial economy through free port status, aiming to make the island into the quote, storehouse of the Western world, end quote, worth more than half a dozen Caribbean colonies. Yet the reorganization of the British Atlantic in the wake of the revolution broke apart Bermuda's commercial trade network. Bermudians also encountered political resistance from their governor, William Brown. Born in Salem, Massachusetts on March 5th, 1737, Brown was in a, a distinguished military and judicial um, career um, in Massachusetts as both the, clone, the colonel of the Essex Regiment and the collector of the Port of Salem in 1764, a judge of the Court of Common Pleas for Essex County in 1770, and served as a judge on the Superior Court in 1774. Brown, in his position, 
as a justice, endeavored to, quote, act with honor and integrity, end quote, in interpreting and enforcing the laws of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Parliament in a, a politically uncertain time period, it, several years following or preceding the, the outbreak of open hostilities between New England colonists and the British army forces in New England. Nevertheless, his position put him at odds with the local committee of safety and Sons of Liber Liberty in Salem, and he left for Boston later in 1774, followed by Halifax in Nova Scotia, and then Britain in 1776. Of Brown's character, John Adams would later observe, the count um, at Massachusetts, um, society made him, quote, a refugee, a Tory, I ver verily believe he never was, end quote. And that, that particular account is um, included in these um, excerpts in the Salem Evening News and Salem News held by uh, the Phillips Library. And I'm very grateful have managed to survive and um, including the, the early image of him because it's, it's actually, um, it doesn't appear that Bermuda's uh, National Archives have uh, surviving images of him at, uh, still to date. Following a five-year residency in Britain, Brown received an appointment as Bermuda's governor in 1781, which he held until he succeeded by Lieutenant Colonel Henry Hamilton in 1788. Brown expressed a less optimistic outlook on Bermuda's commercial resurgence and the islanders' continued American connections. When he requested a contingent of the King's troops to be permanently stationed, at the colony's disused barracks and forts in case the Bermudians decided to restore their ties to the newly independent United States. The British government concurred with this position since they believed that Bermuda had, quote, become too vital to be left in the hands of mere Bermudians, end quote, and embraced a colonial and military policy towards the island designed to make it the Gibraltar of the Western Hemisphere. Reports from naval officers and surveyors comment, comment, yeah, commented in detailed reports to the Admiralty Office about Bermuda's suitability for a naval base, focusing on the islands, encompassing reefs and rocks, that could protect ships in the inner harbors from foreign naval attacks. While the British government's plans for a Bermudian naval station were in their embryonic stages, the islanders increasingly turned to the continuation of the American Revolution's privateering operations against American merchant ships to bring in income and supplies to sustain their island community. Notable privateers include Bermudian Hezekiah Frith and Loyalist Transplant Bridger Goodrich, who brought in thousands of pounds sterling in prize money by condemning ships through Bermuda's vice admiralty courts and established themselves as prominent members of Bermuda's post-revolutionary society. Actions by Bermudian privateers aided in reasserting British maritime power in the Western Atlantic by harassing and diminishing the United States' maritime labor force and merchant fleets, and aided the British government and Royal Navy by capturing Americans and deserting British sailors. Increased British impressment in privateering operations off Bermuda and the Bahamas during the 1790s 
motivated Congress to ensure American sailors' identities, physical descriptions, and citizenship were documented through the passage of an Act for the Protection and Relief of American Seamen of 1796, um, seen here in this extract, printed for the Customs House of Alexandria, held in the, um, the Phillips Library collection. Congress authorized the creation of identity documents that required masters of every ship or vessel of the United States to lodge protests with the authorities at the first port of call that their um, ship landed at and informed American consular authorities of abduction and impressment of their sailors. American merchants and mariners attempted to resist British impressment efforts by acquiring these legal documents and attesting to their status as citizens of the United States or status as long-term immigrants residing therein. Mariners from the towns of Salem and Beverly, such as William Fabens Jr. and John Clemens acquired protection documents from U the U.S. collector at the Port of Salem. Other seamen, such as David Perry, obtained their documentation from Amer the American consulate at Lisbon or at other major ports overseas. Yet these documents did little to deter the Royal Navy from harassing and boarding American merchant vessels at, in the Western Atlantic. Nor British officers from challenging sailors' U.S. citizenship and the impressment of seamen. By 1706, Britain's early and continued aggressions against the United States, pro Americans' property and rights necessitated stronger political, diplomatic, and economic action from the federal government. The first major action was the Non-Importation Act of 1806, targeting British goods in the hopes that the commercial impact would motivate the British government and Royal Navy to cease violations against the rights of neutral American vessels and the impressment of US citizens. Next, the Embargo Act of 1807 expanded on the previous Non-Importation Act by applying it against both Britain and France to end impressment operations and, tar and the targeting of neutral American merchant vessels while attempting to put diplomatic and economic pressure on both France and other European powers, attempting to leverage them against Britain itself. Finally, the failure of the Non-Importation and Embargo Acts to change British policies and the continued harassment of American merchant shipping and impressment activities contributed to Congress and the President James Madison's declaration of war against Britain on June 18, 1812. With the outbreak of war between Britain and the United States, the Royal Navy's fortifications of Bermuda enabled British warships to challenge the United States' sovereignty by blockading American trade at its eastern seaports, closing the Chesapeake, and by launching direct attacks against port cities and the nation, the U.S. Capitol at Washington, D.C. The island's growing naval, naval dockyards and supply depots served as a base from which British military organized and launched its Chesapeake campaign targeting Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. In the months before the fleet set sail for its attack on August 1st, 1814, British Vice Admiral Alexander Cochrane 
used Bermuda as a rallying point that consolidated ships, sailors, a force of 5,000 soldiers, and supplies drawn from Britain, Canada, and the Caribbean. While Bermuda had been central to Britain's intercolonial and transatlantic commerce for much of the 18th century, the War of 1812 emphasizes the island's developed role as a center for Britain's naval power in the Atlantic, especially that its con quote, convenient situation contributed to a great measure, contributed in a great measure to the success and activity of the squadron, which have not been equaled at any part period of the war, end quote. Following the War of 1812, Bermuda's Royal Navy dockyards and base officially replaced Halifax as the permanent British headquarters for the North American Naval Station in 1818. The Bermuda base would later be expanded to include authority over the West Indies um, Naval Stations as the island's location proved better suited to court or counter potential maritime challenges from the United States and more effectively bridge between the Canadian and Caribbean colonies in the Western Atlantic. By 1820, the British government expanded the initial regiment of British troops into a series uh, brought there under William Brown's governorship into, and expanded them into a series of sprawling dockyards, barracks, fortifications, and military storehouses situated across the island. The Bahamas, in turn, became launching points for British efforts to reassert its influence in its previous frontier territories and encourage the Native American and Black Maroon populations in Spanish Florida and the American Southeast to attack the United States' westward moving settlers. Low level traders and military officials played an instrumental role in encouraging support for Great Britain. The Bahamas based merchants and military officers, such as Attorney Alexander George Arbuthnot, Captain George Woodbine, and Lieutenant Robert C. Ambrister, fostered commercial and political relationships with the Seminole and Creek nations and agitated them against American settlers populating the U.S. Spanish Florida borderlands. After the War of 1812's conclusion, Woodbine and Ambrister used the promise of British support as a motivator in their efforts to influence the natives against the United States and project the image of British authority across the southeastern frontier region. What Bynett claimed to be part of a coming British force that would aid their Native American allies, the Seminoles in particular, in regaining their ancestral homelands. And Arbuthnot acted as a petitioner to American, British, and Spanish officials on behalf of the Black and Native peoples on the, the Florida frontier. Acting as traders and agents for Penn, Leslie, and company, Woodbine and Ambrister supplied the Seminole tribes with guns, powder, and ammunition with the primary purpose of maintaining the British Native American trade in furs and deerskins. This also held the secondary purpose of simultaneously supplying the Seminoles with the tools of active resistance to American frontiersmen and military forces. Seminole raids against American settlers hoping to unseat them from occupying Native lands the Seminole's hostile actions, however, resulted in General Andrew Jackson 
and the U.S. Army's invasion of Spanish Florida in 1818. Jackson's invasion captured, court-martialed, and executed Arbuthnot and Ambister on April 29, 1818. These actions ultimately led to the annexation of Spanish Florida by the United States in 1819 to establish order and deter foreign agents from continuing to instigate the region's Native American and Maroon populations against the United States. American intervention in Spanish Florida brought an end to British attempts to assert control over the United States and began the development of an American foreign policy intended to resist European interference in the Western Hemisphere as a means of uh, primary defense for the United States. So to quickly conclude, Bermuda and the Bahamas emergence as a border sea divided the British Empire from the nascent United States reveals their strategic role in securing and extending the influence, um, their influence in the Western Atlantic. Revolutionary American officials' efforts to bolster the Islanders' support for their revolutionary cause and solidify their influence over the islands during the first half of the American Revolution ultimately fell apart and instead saw an increased development or, or um, recalcitrance of American loyalists and pro-British support um, on the islands and activities on the high seas against American vessels and American citizens. Colonies, once considered of little importance to Br the British metropole, gained new providence or new prominence due to their strategic locations as bridges between Britain's North American and Caribbean colonies, as well as launching points for attacks against the United States. By examining border sea island colonies, such as Bermuda and the Bahamas from a strategic or security standpoint, as I have been working on for my Maumee research and my first book project, the American Revolution's fundamental transformation of both loyalties and imperial importance in the maritime Atlantic world becomes more evident. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Okay. Um, while I'm waiting for people to um, pop their questions into the chat, I was wondering if there was anything that you discovered in the library, in our library specifically, <laughs> that surprised you or changed your well, mind about um, about uh, your original thesis. The thing about coming to the library a second time is I've sort of, um, it's sort of, I, I had an idea of what my thesis was going in and it didn't really change it a whole lot. It just added additional depth to it. It's, and while I didn't bring this out a whole lot in my talk, a lot of the um, log books and uh, merchant family papers really add a deeper dimension to the issues with regards to privateering and impressment along the Western Atlantic and the trade routes coming in and out of the Caribbean. And if, if I can make a quick plug in from my Nerf Sea research, um, the PEM and Phillips Library research focuses a lot on Bermuda, but when I went down to Mystic Seaport and accessed the Silas Talbot papers, I discovered a lot of information down there on sort of privateering and impressment operations in and around the southeastern Bahamas and Turks Island that I hadn't previously known about. A lot of the scholarship on 
the Bahamas during uh, sort of the what's called the Loyalist transplant period um, from 1785 through about the 1820s and the War of 1812 really focuses a lot on the social and racial transformation with these Silas Talbot papers and a lot of the um, um, log books and commercial correspondence from Pem, it adds a much deeper dimension to um, sort of the privateering and uh, impressment operations in and around the Bahamas and Bermuda that, that didn't really get as much um, discussion um, by historical scholars. And then there are a lot of limitations to Bahamian and Bermudian scholars trying to do extensive research in the United States because it's a bunch of little bits of documents and um, research collections just spread all over the place. And you know, with the Malmi Fellowship and now the Nerf Sea Fellowship, that's it's allowing me to string together a lot of these collections and make sort of these important connections of what's going on. Um, in the Western Atlantic, in this maritime borderlands region that previous scholarship hasn't dealt with a whole lot. So that leads me to <laughs> my next question, which um, is with the disparate little pieces that you're gathering from the various mm -hmm. archives up here, are there archives in the Caribbean that you have gotten to visit or is that not an option? Have you visited archives <laughs> elsewhere? Well, I visited, I visited the archives in both Nassau, the Bahamas National Archive, and the Bermudas National Archive in Hamilton. And the Bermuda National Archive is really good, as well as their um, you know, national central library on maintaining and digitizing a lot of early eight or 18 late 18th century and early 19th century government documents and newspapers the bahamas less so a lot of their their material is really held in britain at the National Archives, the National Maritime Museum, um, the Caird Library, and the British Library. Those hold the main copies. And it's the same with Bermuda, too. Um, and then there are various um, problems that I could you know, dive into with discussing the, the challenges of researching at Caribbean archives. Um, Anywhere from you know, blackouts and brownouts during the middle of the day, particularly in the summer, to um, decay through mold, particularly for um, paper and linen documents, to just overall hurricane damage, causing you know archives or libraries not being able to to be accessed. So. A lot of the, you know, the safe bet is to go to London to do 18th and early 19th century Caribbean research. It's, I mean, you absolute, I, I'm a strong believer that you should also get on the ground in the locations that you're discussing and actually talk with the people there, the archivists, they know a lot about um just the, the subject material of their colonial histories and societies that can really bring out additional dimensions that you might not get in London or New England. Um, but the, like I said, there are significant challenges to dealing with Caribbean archives, a lot of which are environmental or economic. For sure. High humidity is always a struggle. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a couple of questions from our audience. Um, Heidi would love to know how the shift in British trade 
hub from Halifax to the Caribbean impacted the overall economic growth of Halifax? I'm not, I'm not exactly, yeah. It's, it's difficult to say because I don't do a whole lot of research on um, the Canadian Maritimes and Halifax specifically. Um, I think it's, I would argue that it's, it would be minor or moderate to minor early on, but that would be quickly replaced by um, other exports important to um, Britain or the export trade, such as you know timber or um, other resource materials. Where in the case of Bermuda, the arrival of the Royal Navy and the development of the naval dockyards is a significant investment from um, ex sort of external British government funds that never really was there to begin with during the 18th century. And Bermuda doesn't really have any sort of export. Um, Michael Jarvis digs into this a lot in his book, In the Eye of All Trades, In the Eye of All Trade. Um, Bermuda's and Bermudians' commercial wealth develops from not the export of any um, good produced on the island, but as their role in sort of a carrying service between other British colonies, the metropole, continental Europe, and in uh, smuggling operations, trying to evade the navigation acts between, you know, um, the French Caribbean and the Dutch Caribbean and the mainland uh, 13 colonies. Excellent. Thank you. And was that a recommendation for Jarvis's book? Yes. If you want to know a lot about the development of Bermuda and the circumatlantic commercial trade in the law in 18th century, I would, I would highly recommend it. It's a very thick and dense book, but for Bermudian history, there is now no other book like it. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Mark would love to know how the American colonies treated and viewed the Seminoles and the Maroons with respect to colonial slavery. I mean, with respect to colonial slavery, the Maroons are escaped slaves from um, you know, um, Southeast American plantations. So that they obviously would have a negative view towards them um, and are very much interested in subduing that population and sort of reincorporating them back into um, plantation agriculture, plantation life. With regards to the Seminoles and the Creeks, it's, it's sort of that shifting relationship of um, frontier trade, um, ongoing negotiations, you know, you're friendly sometimes, but not always. Um, but over the course of the War of 1812 and in the years just after it, in the lead up to the Seminole War, things start to take uh, a decidedly you know, very negative term. There are a number of um, sort of brutal attacks that are basically published about in you know, pamphlets and in newspaper accounts um, in the, the sort of East Coast American press that sort of 
starts to turn the American population from being sort of against Native American populations as an obstacle to westward expansion and settlement to this is an active hostile problem. Um, one such example is um, the account of the, the murder of the, I think it's either Berber or Barber family in, on the Georgia frontier. Um, I can't remember the exact title off of the top of my head, but it's like Eunice Barber or Eugene Barber. And that that's reprinted a fair bit. Um, and, and another aspect about sort of the Seminole and the Black Maroon populations, they're aware of sort of the brutality of what's coming when Jackson starts to show up. Um, he comes in in, 17, in 1818, 1819, 1820, and a number of Seminole chieftains try to talk with the Bahamian government to basically get the equivalent of an asylum. They try to flee to the Bahamas. First, they attempt to get legal recognition, but are turned away. And in the second attempt, they just um, sort of canoe or sail across um, the Straits of Florida to Andros Island, which is the sort of wild mangrove swamp forest island on the western side of the Bahamas and sort of live in secret there for decades before the Bahamian government actually discovers them. So there very much is sort of a, a fleeing um, of encroaching American settlers and authority and sort of a view of the Bahamas as a refuge for the Seminoles and or some of the Seminoles, I should say, and in the Marin communities. Very interesting. There's a good article from like, I wanna say 40, almost 50 years ago on the, the Black Seminoles of Andros Island. I have further questions about that, but our audience wants to know some other things. So I'm gonna move on and um, ask how well um, did navigators understand the Gulf Stream during this period? Um, the, the requester Leo asks, says that today you can look at a thermal satellite image to see what it's doing when planning a passage and getting it right can make the difference of days for passages from New England to mm -hmm. um, Atlantic Canada, to Bermuda, the Bahamas, and presumably there would be, that would be a, a tactical yep. advantage. I mean, they understood that the best that they could, given the limitations of the actual science and technology of the, the late 18th and early 19th century. And sometimes the Mariner communities in Bermuda and the Bahamas will exploit this knowledge against metropole officials in London that aren't that they don't believe aren't as certain are certain about the exact um, issues at play. Um, for example, this this is a bit outside of um, my PEM research, but in following the American or following the Seven Years' War, but before the American Revolution, the Bahamas takes over Turks Island as an extension of its colonial territory. Previously in the 18th century, this was run as an extension or a common ground from Bermuda. It's mainly populated um, by seasonal salt breakers from Bermuda, not really by Bahamians, but the Bahamian government under William Shirley made a strong case that Turks Island should be a part of the Bahamas for both an economic, a colonial administrative and a security reason to try to better um, control it and protect it from French and Spanish forces in Cuba and San Domingue. Now, 
uh, how the Bahamians exploit the Bahamians and Bermudians exploit this is that it's on the the Gulf Stream from Turks Island up to Nassau. It's a relatively quick trip, but the Bermudian salt rakers countered that in order for them to go to courts or um, travel from Nass or Turks Island to Nassau, it would take six weeks to travel up the Bahamas because of the shifting currents and trade winds, um, sort of exploiting British officials' lack of understanding of what exactly is going on in order to attempt to hold their sort of the status quo of being affiliated or overseen by Bermuda rather than shifting to the Bahamas. That's that's a bit of a windy example, but interesting. Um, it's it's very interesting sometimes how they um, try to play off different facts about maritime against um, less knowledgeable bureaucrats <laughs> for yes. their, their own advantage. Yeah. Um, Steve would love to know if you have a view regarding whether British activity in Florida after the war in 1812 accelerated um, efforts by the U.S. government to intervene militarily in the Southeast. Could you repeat that question again? Of course. Um, do you have a view regarding whether British activity in Florida after the War of 1812 accelerated efforts by the U.S. government to intervene militarily in the Southeast? Yes, but mainly because Andrew Jackson didn't give them a choice. <laughs> um Yeah, it was it was very much um, a move by Jackson. Um, I think under the Monroe administration, and I think in the, his discussions with Henry Clay and uh, John Quincy Adams, they were trying to sort something out diplomatically with the Spanish um, authorities both there and in Spain, but the situation on the ground was getting to a point that I think Jan either, since I don't remember the exact timeline off the top of my head, either Jackson gained authority, authorization to do it or he just sort of acted on it because it had become such a, a threat to American interests around New Orleans and Pensacola and in the Western Mississippi Territory, that action was deemed a requirement. So it, it did speed up, but it seems like the timeline or, or the mechanism from which it sped up was more in Jackson and the, the British and Seminole population in the Southeast than necessarily uh, federal officials in Washington, DC. Excellent. Thank you. That was great. And it showed how broad your understanding of the area and time and various players um, are and I know we have more questions and I think Dan's gonna make a suggestion for how we can field those. Yes, um, we are slightly over time and I just wanna thank you again, Ross, for your talk and sharing your knowledge and, and um, express our appreciation of your, the use of your use of our collections and we hope it uh, provided some great value to you and wish you the best of luck on your book and on your future studies and hope to see you again in the reading room soon. Um, mm -hmm. If, if you're willing, I'd, um, I'd suggest that the couple of questions we didn't get to, you could maybe okay. um, write responses to them via email. 
Okay. Um, we do yeah, have records of those. Could be sent to me. That would be great. We can definitely do that. And um, and uh, and and we will follow up with that. And I did drop a link in the chat to a very brief survey. If those of you that are attending would like to give us feedback on this program, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and finally, just uh, again, thank you to Ross. Thank you to the Malamy family. And um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the program this evening. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care.